Thank you so much for joining once again uh, to this uh, another wonderful uh, virtual session of SOCM Gem Green Building Council. So friends, first of all, uh, let me congratulate you that uh, our uh, morning inaugural session was really, really wonderful. And we received a wonderful response from the delegates across the nation. I can understand that this is a working day and uh, in your busy schedule, you have joined us uh, in the morning as well as in the evening as well. I can see excellent strength this time also. So this shows your support, guidance and wishes, best wishes uh, to JAM Green Building Certification Program. So myself, Neeraj, once again, welcome you all on behalf of SOCHAM JAM Green Building Council to this uh, wonderful session on restoration of, uh, sorry, this wonderful session on uh, sustainability and green buildings, collaboration and opportunities. So friends, this session is being organized by SOCHAM JAM Karnataka chapter and Maharashtra chapter. And we have galaxy of speakers, as you can see on the screen. We have with us uh, Mr. Pankaj Dharkar, Chairman, SOCM Jam Green Building Council. Architect Lina Kumar, Chairperson, SOCM Jam Karnataka Chapter. Architect Vilas Avachaji, Chairman, SOCM Jam Maharashtra Chapter. Shri D.S. Ramesh, IAS, Housing Commissioner, Government of Karnataka. Architect Roshni Devar, Co-Chairperson, SOCM Jam Maharashtra Chapter. Shri Deepak. Kesarkarji, MLA, Government of Maharashtra, Mr. Avinash Patel, Director, Maharashtra Industrial Development Corporation, Government of Maharashtra, Shri R.K. Gautamji, Director, Sustainability, Kushman and Wakefield, India, Dr. Metha, Medha, Director, Mantra Research and Consultants, Private Limited, Mrs. Swati Ramanathan, Co-Founder, Janagraha Center of Citizen and Democracy, Architect, Kajja Bernard, Mehler Technologies, Germany, and architect Bindi Solapurkar, co-chairperson, SOCM Jam Karnataka chapter. So excellent uh, line of speakers with us for the discussion. And friends, uh, just to share with you, this uh, session is being supported by Ministry of Environment and Climate Change, Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, uh, National Book Trust, Naredco, and it's on. So uh, I would like to welcome uh, Sri Pankaj Dharkar ji for his address. Over to you, Dharkar sir. You, can I have my screen share? Thank you, Neeraj, for uh, setting the tone for this evening. And uh, my sincere thanks to Maharashtra chapter leaders and also uh, Karnataka chapter leaders for uh, such wonderful galaxy of, of speakers. And this is our first session out of uh, six sessions which are going to come up in next uh, two days, uh, rather three days. And then we are going to also have physical sessions in daily India Habitat Center. So thank you very much for this uh, fantastic job, uh, which uh, our team members are doing. And we are really fortunate to have uh, uh, DS Ramesh, uh, uh, Housing Commissioner from Karnataka, uh, Deepak Kesarkar, uh, MLA for Maharashtra, uh, Avinash Patilji, uh, RK Gautamji, uh, Medhaji, uh, Swati ji, um, architect Kadja, uh, and of course, uh, my own team members, uh, Bindi ji, Vilas ji, Lina ji, thank you so much uh, for this wonderful evening. And uh, my personal thanks goes to all the participants, uh, which means a lot on a working day for us. So friends, to, uh, I will just like to take, uh, take you through uh, on a quick presentation. Uh, the GEM certification program is peer headed by ASHOCHAM. ASHOCHAM is uh, serving the nation from 1920 and we have 400 chambers with 4.5 lakhs plus members. Um, friends, this uh, green initiative is taken by um, ASHOCHAM to create the sustainability certification program and we uh, call it CGEM. Our GEM uh, program is completely uh, based on ECBC 2017 and National Building Code of uh, India 2016, takes care of uh, sustainability, daylight, energy, water, indoor air quality, fire and life safety, uh, fresh air, more green areas, uh, human comfort, etc. So uh, this is fantastic uh, uh, program, which uh, which is in, in which is encouraging and creating awareness about 
ECBC and National Building Code. And we do believe these are some wonderful documents which in the Indian architects and engineers have given to the, not only to the country, but to the globe. And a unique thing about our program is it also takes care of, uh, covers fire and life safety as one important component. We do believe in GEM that the building have to be sustain sustainable, should consume less energy, have good indoor air quality, should have good human comfort, but also they should have fire and life safety as important component. Every building we leave has to be safe. Uh, our program is aligned with uh, United uh, Nations SDGs 230. In fact, uh, uh, to understand more about SDGs, our director Neeraj with our uh, SG, uh, Mr. Sood, along with five team members were there at, at COP26. Uh, and we are very proud to say that this is the first comprehensive rating system in the world to recognize sustainability rather than picking up a few components of it. So most of these 30, uh, 2030 goals are being covered by our uh, certification program. And we could understand during COP26 that uh, this is an alignment with them in terms of actively managing potential impacts on environment and local community in terms of providing an accessible and inclusive setting for all, encourage healthy living, ensure a safe and secure atmosphere, and encourage more sustainable behavior, promote the use of responsible sources and uh, uh, responsible use of resources through the supply chain, live positive legacy. I think uh, we are very close to it. We do believe that uh, any certified project uh, will have payback of less than three to four years. In fact, uh, if architects and uh, developers are taking care of uh, pre-planning, the, there is hardly any increase in cost. Uh, our gym program is affordable, at least 30% less than any other program. Uh, and as, as I said earlier, it is complementing the National Building Code and also ECBC 2017. Uh, it, is, it is seen that uh, our program also inspires water audits, waste audits, energy audits. It is also a way forward for net zero carbon neutrality, uh, sustainability reporting, uh, and also trainings to our uh, own future generation will ensure uh, savings on waste, water, energy, move towards carbon neutrality. And this is going to create huge resources for the future in terms of young architects and engineers. Uh, friends, during this, uh, we started just three years back, uh, but with support of great leaders, which I have got uh, today, we have Karnataka uh, leader um, and Maharashtra leaders with us uh, in this program. But soon from 10 chapters, we are going to move towards 20 chapters. And we all are working towards this. You can see the green areas where our chapters exist. Uh, we have quickly started getting uh, recognitions from various organizations. You can see here, uh, Kresil's enlisting uh, GEM certification program with other programs. Uh, Rajasthan government has issued already notification. And through this program, I'm requesting our leaders and also the government uh, officials to help us register this program in Karnataka and also uh, in Maharashtra. Our program is based uh, on JAM 1 to JAM 5 certification at the yardstick of 0 to 135, JAM 1 being uh, the lowest from 40 to 49 points, while JAM 5 uh, when you exceed 105 points. Uh, we have in enlisted a huge number of uh, good projects which are already certified, includes luxury brand hotels of ITC and, High, and Hilton, uh, several factories, uh, giants like Siemens, uh, and um, have trusted us. And you can see the huge number of universities uh, which are already certified, um, beautiful projects across the country. Uh, recently, 10 days back, uh, uh, Prime Minister himself and along with the Railway Minister were at Bhopal. And you can see here, fortunately, our gem certificate for this uh, Kamlapati uh, station is very proudly displayed at prominent places, which was appreciated by Prime Minister himself. Uh, we have to our credit, uh, and because of this certification, a lot of uh, support coming up from our media. And just two months back, we had also dedicated to the nation the first railway station uh, 
uh, which has a five star deluxe hotel of Leela, uh, just above Gandhinagar, which was also dedicated to the nation by Prime Minister and our Chief Minister of Gujarat. Uh, so we have been privileged uh, to have some quality projects uh, across the country. And uh, this media is a testimony of it. A lot of the affordable housing projects uh, in the state of Uttar Pradesh have come forward and also in Punjab, a very important project of Kartarpur Sahib Corridor, which is in recent news, is also Gen 5 certified. Um, you can see the number of uh, metro stations and the airport terminals which have come and certified by us. Friends, during this pandemic, our team has done fantastic job and this slide is testimony of that. 125 webinars, 1,25,000 registrations, 1 lakh registrations uh, attendees, 10 chapters, 14 MOUs with various organizations and uh, societies, 85 MOUs with the universities. And this is where uh, we put our heart and soul. We want our next generation of architects and engineers uh, to have their, uh, their sustainability should be way of their life. And this is what we really want to pursue in a big way. And I'm sure uh, in even today's uh, session, we have uh, stalwarts like Roshni Ji coming from uh, the sim, she's also spending a lot of time and other leaders are also spending a lot of time with several universities to inspire young generation. Uh, currently, Maharashtra is uh, topping our list of universities. You can see the top 23, Karnataka has six. I'm looking forward for a lot of uh, universities coming from Karnataka. And uh, our mission 100 is going to get surpassed. And I think we should be setting our target for mission 200 soon when we meet together in uh, Delhi. Uh, all these organizations, whether it is ISHRAE, ASHRAE, uh, IAQA, which is International Society for Indoor Air Quality, we were just talking about IAQ levels, which are raising in Delhi and other parts of the country. Of course, Karnataka is better off, but the main cities that we are seeing this increase. So we have tied down with uh, International Association of uh, from USA, and they are helping us. Uh, we have a very interesting program uh, where we certify the gym professionals. We conduct a free of cost training. Neeraj, Shubh, and uh, Neeta are doing a fantastic job here. Every fourth Saturday, we do this. And uh, we have an online exam, which is for 90 minutes. Anybody can give exam 24 7. And once you pass this exam, uh, you are certified as professional. So, I'm, all the young people, uh, potential architects, we are looking forward for you be becoming our torch bearers, becoming the lead uh, AP. Friends, this program is very unique. Uh, you can see here we have uh, 80 plus speakers who are going to share their views starting today. Uh, and thanks to uh, once again to our team of uh, Karnataka and uh, Maharashtra for taking up such important subject, uh, which is going to be an interesting thing to happen in terms of collaboration and opportunities. So thank you once again to all of you and thank you, uh, Neeraj, for coordinating this. Thank you, Dharkarji, for the very energetic and encouraging uh, message. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now uh, I would request architect Lina Kumar, chairperson, SHM GEM Karnataka chapter and principal architect and partner Kumar Consultants. So I'll not take much time and would request Lina ji for her address, welcome address. Over to you, madam. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Pankaj Dharkar. We have a very inspiring leader in uh, Dharkar ji and an extremely dynamic team at GEM. I must comment on that. It's been a wonderful association and it's great working together. Technology is like a double-edged sword. It's designed to make living simpler and easier. And in doing so, it complicates life in many ways through its complex network of interdependence. Within this complex simplicity, sustainability is a common problem that touches the lives of all humans across nations, cultures, and economies. It concerns different people in different ways with varying concerns. From the very basic human need of staying alive and survival, to the very, la very lavish lifestyle and of extravagances. We are a global population of about 7.9 billion today, and each one of us is really entitled to a place in the sun. 
in order to be able to cater to this varied and vast kaleidoscope of human living, collaboration and partnerships become an important process through which we can work together to address the assorted issues that arise, arise out of the primordial concern of survival to the ultimate concern of innovation and sustainability. To collaborate, it would mean to iron out systems by which we could work together with each other, with other people and groups of peoples towards a common goal. A common goal, I think, that every citizen of this earth would aspire for. The goal to be able to live together with mutual respect to each other and to the earth that we live on. In this session on collaborations and opportunities towards sustainability and green buildings, we bring to you eminent speakers and change makers and welcome our list listeners to this session. To Sri D. S. Ramesh, Housing Commissioner, Government of Karnataka, Sri Deepak Kesarkar, MLA, Government of Maharashtra, Mr. Avinash Patil, Director, Maharashtra Industrial Development Corporation, Government of Maharashtra, Mr. R. K. Gautam, Director, Sustainability Kushman and Wakefield India, Dr. Dr. Medha Tatpatrikar, Scientist and Director, Architect Swati Ramanathan, Co founder Janagraha, Center for Citizen and Democracy. Architect Kacha Bernard, Mahela Technologies Germany, our team members from Maharashtra and Karnataka, our respectful greetings and appreciation. To begin our session, I invite our guest of honor, Housing Commissioner, Government of Karnataka, Sri D. S. Ramesh, to address the gathering. But to briefly announce, briefly introduce him before his address. Mr. D. S. Ramesh has over 30 years of diversified experience in administration development and training, and also project management in various bilateral, multilateral projects like World Bank, Danida, and Netherlands-funded rural development projects in the Karnataka state. He is presently the commissioner of the Karnataka Housing Board and is responsible for planning and executing works that are necessary for the purpose of dealing with and satisfying the needs of housing accommodation in the state. He has earlier served as the Mission Director, National Health Mission, Deputy Commissioner of Davangiri District, Executive Director of the Karnataka Examination, Private Secretary to the Honorable Housing Minister. He's been involved with Rural Development and Panchayat Raj from 2006 to 2011, with the Karnataka State working in several districts and the World Bank aided projects. Over to you, Mr. Ramesh. Ramesh ji, over to you. Can you hear us? Hello. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, we sir. can hear you, sir. You can hear? Yeah, yes, yeah. Yes. Yeah, good evening. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, yes sir. Yes. Please switch on your video also, sir. We can hear you. Sir, you are unmute. You are muted again. Please unmute yourself and open your video if possible. Button is just next to mute. There is a stop video on video. Yeah. Harish, please unmute him. No, sir. Yeah, please unmute him and. Uh... Yes, Ramesh, please speak. The video, no? Well, it is not on its yeah. Yeah. Probably some problem is there. I think no now problem. the no. mute is on. Okay. Yeah, please. Please speak, sir. Please, uh, sorry. No problem. Yeah. Yeah. So good evening. Good evening, everybody. And um, I think first of all, I am very glad to be a part of you know uh, this conclave. In fact, I am uh, not a expert on this subject in fact but uh, just i wanted to you know put one or two thoughts uh, which i have come across uh, first of all i am so happy uh, to give me this opportunity to be a, a you know a member of this um, conclave uh, 
uh, I think as far as the sustainability, we are all talking about, uh, especially in uh, uh, building construction and all that, whatever the activities which are uh, now being taken up by the association, I am so uh, no uh, happy about uh, the activities. In fact, in 2019, they have also started the gym. Uh, so mainly to create the awareness among the people uh, as well as the building class. So in this aspect, I think a lot of development has been you know, taken place uh, around the globe. Uh, I am very eager to hear from the experts. In fact, uh, what are all the latest developments in uh, because as a Karnataka housing board, uh, we have also you know, involved in major construction activities uh, from various departments from the uh, government, so major works which are, we, are, we are taking up, in fact, and also we are also you no know, taking up these activities mainly for you no know, uh, the building uh, construction activities and how best we can uh, take uh, these uh, elements into consideration while constructing. Mm -hmm. But one or two things which I am looking for from the experts is how the uh, no we we need to look uh, as far as the cost mm -hmm. effective mm -hmm. solutions can be incorporated in bringing the, the sustainability in the building construction activities and uh, also the acceptabilities when we are talking about this sustainable no uh, elements which needs to be brought in while uh, constructing how best we can incorporate and uh, even the common people should be in a position to accept uh, the solutions which we are going to propose uh, uh, for the sustainability elements so these two things I am uh, eagerly looking from the experts, so uh, the latest uh, updates. Uh, so I am very glad to be a part of this and uh, I'm so uh, uh, wish you all the best once again uh, for the conclave. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Sri DS Ramesh ji. So sir uh, and, and Lina ji, please correct me if I'm wrong. So, sir, uh, various states are giving uh, some incentives uh, to the green buildings being constructed in the state. Say, for example, in some states, extra FAR is being given. And in some states, you know, uh, you know, uh, some uh, relaxation in the property tax, etc. is given. So, uh, we would like if uh, we would like to understand that if uh, government of Karnataka is also uh, planning to give some kind of incentives or to the green buildings or uh, something like that. So, I mean, that would be a great thing. So, uh, as far as I understand, uh, uh, Lina ji, uh, I think there is no such uh, 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 incentive programs in the state. Am I right? Yes, not as yet, yes. But yeah. we hope that it does come through. And yeah. I'm sure our commissioner, Mr. Ramesh, could also assist us in having plans like this. So, you know, we can encourage sustainability and that really is the mission and the goal of uh, GEM and to suit everybody. Yeah. I mean, not, it's not only about GEM, it's really about humankind. Yeah, yeah, because, uh, you know, uh, in last uh, couple of months, we have received uh, some requests from uh, government of Himachal Pradesh and government of Gujarat as well. They are also planning to extend some incentives to the green buildings being constructed in the state. So if, uh, you know, government of Karnataka is also willing to, you know, uh, do something. So SOCM support is always there uh, uh, and we will support you uh, in making uh, uh, such policies for the state, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much once again. And now uh, I would request architect Vilas Avachadji, Chairman Association Jem Maharashtra Chapter and Managing Director, Mr. Vilas Avachad and Associates. We would like to hear from you, sir. Over to you. Yes. Thank you, Neerajji. Good evening, everybody. Pankaj Dharkarji, Chairman Association Jem. Uh, I can say our uh, Honorable uh, Deepak Bhai Kesarkar. M MLA Maharashtra Government of Maharashtra, uh, Mr. Avinash Patil, Director MIDC, uh, Lina Kumar, Chairman Karnataka Chapter, my co chairperson, Roshni Ud architect Roshni Udiawar, and Niraji, and of course, another architect, uh, Ted G. Bernard, I think she's from German. So, uh, good evening, everybody. Now, sustainable and green building collaboration opportunity and opportunities. Here are, you know, uh, one of the one of the keys of unlocking sustainability with the leaders of all the sectors of society 
agreeing that they are solving environmental and social challenges required unparalleled cooperation. Another thing is that the green building relevant in the sustainable development. There are new technologies. Constant constantly being developed to the complement current practices in the creating greener and st greener structures. The common objective of the green building is to reduce overall impact of build environment of the human health and natural environment. But it has to reach to the common man. It should be used to the daily basis. Then it will be sustainable and uh, these challenges can be affordable. There is another sustainable collaboration, funding collaboration processes, funding collaboration tools. All these are, you know, the basis uh, business cultures, cultural re re reasons. And for the continuous use of the tool, increase productivity. See, there are, uh, uh, with this, we can always collaborate, finding collaboration with the common man. When the common man is there, you know, be, uh, you, one can uh, have his own individual passion, and but that passion should come into the, an action. So once that comes in an action, it can be a sustainable initiative development ambitious, but it should again come to the long term goals that are only marginally relevant to the short terms. Uh, with this, I think uh, we all can uh, think together the values of each other perspectives contribution towards their shared visions and values. This will help us for the uh, sustainability and uh, we can have a collaboration. We have uh, many opportunities in that, which should reach to the common man, which I think, uh, you know, we all have heard till now that, you know, we, we save power. If, if, you, uh, if you all remember our parents used to tell us, okay, when you are coming out of the room, please put off the lights, put off the light. Why they are saying that? Because they know it is inherent in their own blood that power has to save. So it's a power. So this this is what sustain. Uh, this will uh, you know these are these are the uh, sm uh, smaller things. But we should we should learn and it should come to the common people. That's what I would like to say. Thank you very much, Niraji. Thank you, yeah. thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is Shub. Uh, so we would like to introduce uh, architect Rosni Udayavar uh, here. So uh, is that uh, is that fine, sir? Yeah. That is architect Rosni Udayavar ji, uh, uh, co-chairperson Association of Maharashtra Chapter, director of Rosni Udayavar and Associates. It. And uh, thank you, ma'am, for being here. So we would like to hear from you about. Uh, Sustainability and your take on the collaboration and opportunities are about green buildings. So, yeah, over to you, ma'am. Thank you. So, can you can can you share my presentation? Yeah, yeah, we can share the presentation. Yes, sure. Because we, we'd like to share there it. will be a, a, a technical glitch. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. That's uh, fine. Good afternoon, yeah. uh, yes, all my uh, co members. Uh, President uh, Darkar ji uh, and all the entire team. First of all, hearty congratulations to all of you uh, for this putting up this excellent uh, event and show. Uh, great work by the team. Uh, and uh, uh, I think uh, ever since 2019 lockdown, we have uh, seen such a wonderful work uh, and so much of uh, dissemination of knowledge by this team over a period of time. So. It's really great to be part of it, and I'm sure there are lots of things that uh, we will be doing together uh, for sustainability and for green buildings. Uh, I have a small presentation here, uh, which already went through a technical glitch. Some of the pictures and slides have disappeared, uh, but I will share whatever is uh, is the re remaining. Uh, so, uh, can I, can we go to the next slide, please? So uh, we are just 
uh, we just finished COP26, which was a big uh, historic event in the world as far as sustainability, as far as climate change and climate action is concerned. And uh, India gave its uh, five top commitments, uh, five commitments of going net zero emissions by 2070, of you know coming to uh, going towards 500 uh, gigawatts in its renewable energy and many others of reducing its carbon intensity. So a lot of people have been focusing on not go going back on the coal, but in fact, we have made a lot of commitments and we have a huge responsibility on our shoulders. Uh, and that we will have to do because, uh, you know, as a country, uh, we, uh, we stand forth in the world uh, in terms of carbon emissions. Uh, go, uh, can we go next, please? And uh, buildings, uh, the building in industry of which we are all a part uh, is playing a huge role in this uh, carbon emissions. That is 39% of all emissions, including the embodied energy as well as the operational energy is because of buildings. So again, there is a major role for us to play. Next, please. I would like to talk here a little bit of what I have been doing and what my team has been doing through uh, what is known as Institute of Environmental Architecture and Research. And this is a lot about sustainability and collaboration. And uh, a lot of activities have already been done uh, through uh, with ASOGEM, with uh, a lot of other organizations and uh, a good example of what kind of uh, you know, sustainability networking is required in the future. Next, please. So basically, uh, we are uh, uh, an institute which is a Mumbai-based educational research training institute and uh, with a vision to create a sustainable environment through scientific research, education, training, social cultural understanding, community engagement and awareness. And the mission of this organization is environment first. Next. We have been together for almost 20 years, our entire team. And uh, we started in 2002 with a diploma, a first uh, postgraduate diploma in environmental architecture, which was then affiliated to the Maharashtra State Board of Technical Education. And uh, then in 2005, we started the master's program in environmental architecture. I think uh, that, uh, you know, communicating with the new, next generation, with architects, engineers on uh, environment is a, is a very critical aspect that we need to work on. Next. Uh, apart from the academic uh, work that we have been doing, uh, off-site, on-site training programs, uh, taking people right into the forest to teach them what ecology is, working with government and non-governmental organizations. Uh, this has been a part of our work. And uh, in 2015, uh, we were recognized uh, by the UNDP and Bureau of Energy Efficiency for our work in capacity building in Maharashtra. Next, please. Uh, we also had a great opportunity to work on uh, preparing a roadmap for implementation of the Energy Conservation Building Code in Maharashtra, which included also the climate zonation of Maharashtra. And actually, this went on to lead uh, to the Green Building Policy, which, which was recently uh, released in Maharashtra. And, uh, you know, some of the municipal corporations have already adopted it with incentive schemes and so on. Uh, and here we had the opportunity to work with both Urban Development Department and the Maharashtra Energy Development Agency. And uh, uh, our, one of our guests today, Mr. Avinash Patel, was part of the team. Next. Uh, here, uh, we did also work on something called a sustainable village tourism in the state of Maharashtra. When we talk about reaching out to people, uh, this was a unique opportunity because most of the people who are concerned with sustainability are also in the villages. They are the ones who have the lowest footprint, but who face the maximum impact. So uh, we got an opportunity to work with, uh, with the Ministry of Rural Development and Honorable Deepak Kesar Kalji in you know, preparing a master plan for sustainable village tourism in 21 villages and five circuits in Maharashtra. Next, please. And we are constantly doing lots of training programs, hands-on workshops. These are some of the 
recent workshops we have done on training with bamboo, uh, tree plantation, small is beautiful, many, many kind of uh, programs that we have done. Next, please. Uh, during the lockdown also, of course, we got the opportunity to reach out, to share knowledge, to disseminate knowledge. Uh, and we've done lots of programs also with uh, jointly with ASOCHEM, but a variety of topics uh, that people could, you know, uh, learn from. And we had between 500 to 100 to 500 participants in each of these, uh, uh, each of these events. Next. Uh, we organized also a symposium for environment professionals, uh, which had people from all over the world, uh, including, you know, from Germany to US and Israel, and also our own uh, members from ASOCHEM participated in this. Next, please. And we had a, a very um, joint project on energy efficiency in buildings, which we did with ASOCHEM, GEM, and CTS College of Architecture. Uh, from 9 to 14 December to celebrate the Energy Conservation Week. We had uh, the International Symposium, uh, which we uh, on youth leadership and climate action, which we did with the uh, children now in Montreal, Canada. Uh, this was also online, but uh, with this, we are developing youth committees uh, in all the continents for climate action. Next, please. Uh, during our foundation day in 21, we actually had in August 21, we actually had another collaboration with EnviroCare Labs Private Limited, which is uh, has almost uh, you know 100 years of experience in lab in environmental testing, and they are also uh, joining hands for training and research. Next, please. And uh, we also got the opportunity to work with a team of uh, uh, people from 14. Uh, 14 partners from six countries on something known as uh, NISARG, which is Novel Integrated Sustainable and Affordable Renewable Energy Grid. Uh, this is something like in the future, looking towards off-grid communities, which will be free in terms of water, waste, and energy. Next, please. Uh, a joint collaboration with the uh, uh, Bezalel College and Hebrew University over the last four years. Next, year, next please. Uh, which we have been doing uh, from 2016 to 2019. It's a sustainable design workshop with exchange program called as uh, Small is Beautiful. Uh, the next step to this is that we are developing a joint program with VTU uh, Belagavi on a master's program and a postgraduate uh, diploma program on sustainable design and development. Next, please. So uh, just to conclude, I have shown you the variety of activities that we have been doing, but uh, really the, uh, the thing that we are focusing on is to make sustainability mainstream. And the way to do that is to probably reach out to the youngsters. Uh, our newest collaboration is with KGR University, a KGR College in Hyderabad. And uh, we think that all of these things that are mentioned here, policies, uh, you know, voluntary ratings, uh, reaching out to students in colleges, uh, value-added courses for professionals, as well as collaboration with industry and trade organizations. These are all important in making sustainability mainstream and in getting uh, you know, everybody to change and move towards that net zero uh, uh, target that we have of 2070. So uh, with that, I will close my talk. And uh, we have two guests from uh, Maharashtra, uh, but uh, as and when uh, both of them are uh, busy in their meeting, so as and when they come, uh, I will be happy to introduce them. Uh, over to you, Shubhi. Thank you, thank you, Rosni ji. And uh, with due respect, on the permission with the with the moderator, our teacher Bilas ji. So this thing we uh, learned one thing that. Uh, despite a lot of differences, a lot of uh, things that is that are not uh, similar, but one thing we are united and when we are talking about sustainability and green buildings and the collaborations and opportunities, we can see Maharashtra and Karnataka, the, both the ethos when, when they compare to each other, it is same. And uh, not only uh, inside the nations, internationally, we have the same voice, we have the same concerns towards environment, towards the green building sector, sustainability as a whole. 
so that's what we can see in all this uh, all the speeches so far uh, and all the addresses so far and we are very much happy about it uh, that uh, the government government of karnataka government of maharashtra and the even the government of india all the state governments they are doing a lot of things in this direction so we are united in this for sure so here i would like to take some moment uh, to introduce mr rk gautam uh, harish ji the slide please so ladies and gentlemen uh, mr rk gautam is the director of sustainability assessment and wet fields india so he will uh, illuminate us with this topic uh, uh, regarding uh, collaboration and what are the opportunities available in india and outside as well uh, so uh, what do you sir thank you very much uh, for the introduction too. yeah thank you if somebody can uh, enable my slide share yeah you you will get your sir, right here yeah. Ah, yeah, I think you have it. Not yet. Okay. Are you able to see my screen? Uh, yeah, right now we can see it full screen. Yeah, no issues. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So uh, at the outset, uh, let me thank uh, uh, the organizers, uh, Shashan, for organizing this wonderful event. Uh, the theme is so aptly and timely worded. Uh, thank you very much for that. And good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Arke Gautam. I represent a company called Kushman Wakefield. I'm an architect uh, by profession, uh, and currently I have their sustainability business. Uh, so, for obvious reasons, uh, green buildings could be seen as the building blocks of or enablers of sustainable development or sustainable environmental system. And uh, as you see on the screen, green buildings also actually contribute or impact almost nine of the sustainable development goals that the world has set itself. Uh, for. And those are the goals that you see, whether it is uh, clean energy or economic growth or infrastructure, uh, cities and communities, consumption and production, climate action, life on land, uh, and, and of course, the, the last number on the list, the partnerships. So all, or in some way or the other, are interconnected with the way we build the buildings and the way we make them efficient and environmentally less impactful, right? And these interconnections, uh, is what defines or establishes the collaborations on 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 these uh, six six aspects aspects of uh, designing buildings or constructing and operating them. Right, the the six you see in front of in the screen, and these are of course well known to everybody. Uh, we are from the construction industry, and we are all mostly converted. Uh, so, but the but the Details that we are yet to realize, though we know for sure to an extent, are the the collaborations that are embedded in each of them uh, with the rest of the stakeholders. So, yeah, of course, building industry has the largest stakeholders ever, and in fact, some of the uh, building projects, uh, the stakeholders are almost 60 to 80 of them. For example, a typical uh, airport building or the Central Vista project uh, redevelopment in Delhi, those have hundreds of stakeholders and there is obviously an element of collaboration between each of them to make the project uh, worthwhile, to make the project efficient, to make the project meet the functional goals. So the, the first thing that comes to my mind is the design aspect of any project where right from the conception to detailed drawings to concept level drawings to working drawings, uh, everything is being put on uh, two dimensions and then of course these days they are expressed in three dimensions and what is missing in this is the collaboration that we look forward to make these uh, design elements uh, more sustainable. Uh, sense that green buildings, though it uh, green building certification, for example, though it uh, deals with uh, the design and construction phase of a typical built environment or a building, sustainability is, of course, as you all agree, is much more than just getting a building uh, certified green. 
So in the sense that it is just the beginning of making the building, the built environment and its operations sustainable environmentally, right? So in this uh, endeavor, the designers, there's not just one team, as you know, there'll be multiple uh, disciplines of design involved, uh, starting from electromechanical uh, and a lot of other um, emerging technologies that are being used in buildings. So all these stakeholders come together in the design phase and they ensure that the, the design is uh, friendly, of course, the design is made in such a way that wastage or uh, other environmentally harmful aspects of it are uh, designed out in the, in the first place in itself, uh, which means that the design is in such a way that there is a collaborative approach in making each element of the building, the, the embedded uh, footprint, the environmental footprint of the building is made to minimum. And this is obviously followed by a procurement phase wherein also there's a lot of um, focus that is these days missing. Uh, only thing that construction and procurement don't have too much of uh, environmental footprint. Of course, the activity as such doesn't have, but then the results are the impact of a, a properly phased and, uh, and organized uh, procurement and construction program will, of course, uh, lead to a, a larger sustainability meeting the largest sustainability goals. And here again, there are many, uh, we call stakeholders, uh, which are collaborating with each other at any point of time, uh, whether it is the OEMs, original manufacturers or suppliers, or the installers, even the packers and movers, probably when a building is decommissioned, those who are involved in decommissioning. Similarly, the construction phase, there are many collaborators involved, all the stakeholders, um, and they pass on the whole package of the building or that they design in a sustainable way to the operations team. Though the percentage of uh, the environmental footprint of a typical building is less during the design and construction phase and very large in operational phase, but then the piece that we saw during the construction, procurement, and building phases will obviously impact or influence the way a building is operated sustainably. And of course, sir, building, yeah. Sir, sorry to interrupt, sir. There are like, uh, is, can the audio be a little bit louder from your side? I mean, uh, there might be okay. participants might be having problems. Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I hope audible now. So um, as the building comes to the end of its life cycle, uh, we, we simply think that it can be demolished and a new construction can be uh, then, in, in fact, we have seen a few recent uh, Supreme Court judgments where they have ordered buildings to be demolished just uh, because they have all probably uh, violated a few environmental laws. But then there should be a way out to make these buildings, uh, when they are being demolished or decomm decommissioned, uh, to, to actually demount them or deassemble them brick by brick so that uh, they can again be put into a phase called rebuilding which is a reconstruction of the whole uh, aspect of the building. Uh, and then that will lead to a circularity uh, in construction. In fact, construction is the only business where you can actually attain 90% of circularity in the whatever we build. But then we are only realizing probably 5 to 10% of circularity in the form of probably repurposing or reusing some of the uh, construction demolition waste. And then when we actually move to the opportunities, apart from the collaborations, which were all there and we just recapped them, it's not nothing, nothing new to any of them, any of us. But then the opportunities uh, hiding inside each of these uh, aspects uh, is, is very vast. Uh, in the sense that when it comes to energy, water, waste, for example, I read them as renewables, neutral, water neutrality or circularity of, of materials. So the hidden uh, text in this, the invisible text is that when you talk about energy, it's, it's a very imperative that we should move into uh, clean energy, uh, is of course uh, any uh, type of renewables that we have uh, commercially available. And then when it comes to water, it's not just the water that we consume, we're bringing down the water consumption, we're probably uh, using uh, water efficient fixtures and then having some kind of consciousness uh, not wasting water, but then in fact, we should be looking at the water neutrality aspect of it. When a particular development is done on a piece of land, the water resources that are available on that particular land should actually be maintained or in fact uh, possible be enhanced 
after the conception of, or after the development is made. Similarly, as I just mentioned, every brick, every aspect, every component that goes into a building that can actually be put into a circular loop, and then thereby we keep continue or keep constructing the building with the with similar kind of materials. Probably we may add 10 to 15 percent of virgin or new materials, but then most of the uh, other components can be reused. In fact, this is something like I take the uh, example of a human body where uh, we are, as as the argon uh, donation campaign say, we are actually wasting most of our argons, which are working well, which are working fine uh, when 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 the death occurs. And though and so if the campaign for uh, donating the argons is very uh, valid. Similarly, most of the components in the building, though a lot of it is uh, salvaged when the building is uh, demolished or decommissioned, but still there is a hundred percent of scope or I mean lot of scope to make that circular. Similarly, the, now the trend is to go net zero, nations, organizations, individuals, uh, firms, everybody is looking at a specific uh, goal or target to go net zero. And of course, this is not a net zero in the sense that we can uh, compensate or we can offset the emissions that we are looking at. But here, the net zero specifically means that the emissions that are building through its uh, design operations and its decommissioning life cycle, uh, the emissions that this process emits is not just uh, avoided, but also removed from the atmosphere, which of course, some of the technologies available today are able to uh, help us in that direction. Then now, of course, we all talk about uh, universal accessibility or uh, access, but then a lot of buildings even now, uh, at least uh, not in the uh, uh, five, uh, probably the metro cities, but then most of the building stock uh, uh, that probably I would know is of, uh, have not been taking this uh, universal access into consideration, other than providing a, a electric uh, ramp at the entrance of the building. Most of the aspects are uh, ignored. I have a few examples. If there is time, I will take you through. Otherwise, uh, it, it's, it's it's very imperative that we incorporate universal access for these buildings. And then, of course, when we build, we should also be taking care of the environment, not just the environment, but the ecology. Which means that there's a lot of biodiversity existing before and after a building is built or a, or a development is made. In fact, there's a concept, interesting concept of uh, uh, net biodiversity net gain, which means that the, the biodiversity quantity and, the, for example, richness that is available before a building or development is made is actually maintained or enhanced after the development is done. This is where you actually gain in terms of net uh, number of species or the variety of species in that particular geography. Uh, so it's not just a building a building, it's also taking care of the environment around it. That's important. So these are some of the opportunities that I've listed. I will not go through them uh, one by one. These are also the interventions that uh, most of them are cost effective, most of them are low hanging fruit, uh, whether it is uh, taking solar energy into each of our use cases, whether it is the lampposts or, um, of course, these days we have a lot of uh, push on the uh, electrical vehicles and then unless you have this charging infrastructure everywhere uh, something like what you see on the left uh, the the uptake or the adoption will not go up uh, similarly there can be a lot of applications within a campus within a building that we can think of there could be at least 20 30 40 such opportunities or use cases that we can think about and only a few are listed here just as an example similarly when it comes to water it's not just uh, the, again the reluctant or the uh, or the formal or nominal rainwater harvesting that we do, but there are a lot of uh, other opportunities to actually harvest this water and then use it throughout the year and then use it judiciously in terms of, for example, the example you see on the right, automated micro uh, irrigation, micro drip irrigation systems. Similarly, waste, managing waste has become a large uh, project or a huge among us challenge these days and then having some kind of technology and make some kind of self-monitoring, self-compacting smart bins, uh, which of course we hear a lot of them in the Western countries, but then they don't cost much. It is just a matter of using them appropriately uh, and then be conscious about them. And similarly, uh, reusing some of the wasted materials like plastic, metal, uh, wood in the uh, common or public or street furniture. That is, uh, there is a lot of uh, now awareness on the uh, waste pollution especially in our capital city. And there are a lot of ways of simple and very uh, easy ways of uh, in that uh, enhanced air around us. 
there are a few things mentioned here, but then of course the problem I'm talking about in Delhi is much more than this. But then in any city, any developing city, uh, the vehicle air pollution and then industrial pollution can actually be tackled in a very easier and some kind of consistent ways. And then this is what I was uh, uh, talking about, uh, giving access to all types of uh, people. It's not just the physical disabilities, it's also psychological or mental or uh, intellectual disabilities. It can be age, size, gender. It can be anything that actually makes somebody uh, in, a, in a disadvantaged position and then the buildings have to support them. And nowadays you have this kind of, on the right you see, uh, a public signing system where there's a typo for so Braille new one, which is actually a combination of normal text with a Braille uh, text in, incorporated in it, so that you don't have a separate text for it. All public signage can probably have some kind of directional signage in terms of this uh, this um, method, where both sighted and unsighted or blind people can actually read. Okay, um, and then the last one is about biodiversity, which I talked about. Most of our developments have some patches. Uh, if we can't uh, allocate some uh, land for them, it's not fair to them because it's like something like uh, a joint development, right? We see in cities, when we buy uh, or partner with a landlord, we take the land and then build upon it, but then we provide a few, uh, say, floors in that building to the landowner, right? So similarly, we are taking this land from uh, this ecology, this species of the uh, life, other than humans, and then we need to provide them back I give them back some space uh, land in, inside our development. So these are some of the excellent ideas of uh, making that possible, whether it is managed and curated uh, sanctuaries or artificial wetlands, or the, these days the Miyawaki forest kind of mini forests with native species. So there I am, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, over to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Vilaji, you would like to add in something? Okay, sir. So thank you very much. Uh, here we I would like to like uh, like the fact that the collaborations when you're talking about collaborations when we're talking about the opportunities, you like you kind of summarize the thing like collaborations. Uh, it's the uh, starts the opportunity starts from the collaboration itself. And uh, when you when you talk about the design and building construction on the real estate market or any kind of things, lot of things maybe it material, maybe it air quality, energy, water. Or uh, or uh, any kind of biodiversities, or you can uh, talk about the system, the sites itself, the soil itself. A lot of things come up with that. It's a, it's a, it's kind of a byproduct. And when got call about uh, green financing and green jobs, like a lot of participants are right now are writing in the chart about where is the opportunities of uh, employment and the finances and everything. So all of them also comes along with it uh, in one way. Not only inside India, but internationally as well. So I feel uh, that's the way forward and that's the right way forward. And that's why we all are here to, together. And it shows that when all of the, the, the inter country in, in, in this kind of virtual sessions, the inter country, all our chapters are being united together just to showcase this thing and just to just to let people know that we all are together on this. So don't worry. So it is the right way forward. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, note. And uh, we are also blessed to, to have support of uh, Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, uh, Ministry of Environment, Pleasure and Climate Change. Uh, Council of Architecture, NBT India, and, and Aretko. So, and we are also thankful to our sister partners, without whom this uh, event would not be possible, and which includes, but not limited to our Prince Pipe Pipings and Fittings, or Lubrichol, Panasonic, Meta Tubes, ALP, or Inier Engineering, Daikin India, and JSW. And so I would like to play a short video of uh, Lubrichol uh, to just to give you an idea of how, how we are moving forward together. Thank you. Harishi, can you play the video, please?
Yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you everyone for that. Uh, uh, great support and the Lubrigel, you can see that, 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 that there is a life cycle analysis was done by Lubrigel as well. And uh, it's, a, it's a good product, I can say. And right now we can go move further for our next speakers. Our industry speakers, Dr. Medar Tapatrigar and uh, Mr. Swati Ramanathan and our social partner, architect Kaja Bernard. So I would like to welcome uh, Lina Ji, architect Lina Kaman, to introduce our industry speakers and social partner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shubh. Uh, let me introduce Dr. Medha Pat Tadpat Tadpatrikar very briefly. Uh, uh, Dr. Medha Tadpatrikar is a plastic warrior, writer, and entrepreneur. She earned her PhD in branding, an MBA from Nottingham University, UK, and an LLB from Pune University. She has studied for MSc in psychology and has completed many diplomas in subjects ranging from IPR, journalism, marketing, and for scenic science. So, you know, she's multifaceted and multi talented, multi knowledge. She's the co founder of Rudra Blue Planet Environmental Solutions, India Limited, Mantra Research and Consultants Private Limited, and Phoenix General Insurance Brokers Private Limited, where she serves as a director. In 2010, she built her first pilot machine successfully converting waste plastic into usable fuel and is currently running three plants in Jejuri, Pune Municipal Corporation, and Kalyan Dombiwali Municipal Corporation. Some of her clients include Gadre Marine, Venkateshwara Hatcheries, Kirloskar Oil Engine, and Maxins in Gujarat. She's the founding trustee of Keshav Sita Memorial Foundation Trust, which is instrumental in creating awareness of waste plastic and segregation at source for better waste management. <laughs> Today, the trust collects waste plastic from more than 35,000 households, hotels, and offices in and around Pune. The trust has also been collecting waste plastic from faraway places like Paramati, Baneshwar, Raigad Fort, Bhima Shankar, Thane, and Dumbivili. Her efforts have helped in the collection of more than 2,500 tons of waste plastic, which was otherwise headed for landfill. She has penned two books, namely Domestic Violence, A Reality, and Impressive Manners. She's a recipient of many awards, and some of them are, to name just a few. Top 30 Women Transforming India from Niti Aayog 2019. Long-Term Achievement Environmental Leadership 2021 by J.K. Yog in USA. TIP 20 in Abu Dhabi 2020. Swachodaya UP Award 2019. I Women Global Award 2019. Lok Sata Durga Award 2021 amongst others. She's a trained Bharatanatyam and Kathak dancer, but devotes more, a majority of her time on creating awareness on waste plastic. Over to you, Dr. Tatpatrikar. We look forward to listening to what you have to say. You've got a varied and a very um, impressive academic career and your professional journey too. Over to you. Thank you very much, Lina ji. Uh, can, is it possible for me to share the screen or Harish, you will like to share my presentation? That's fine as well. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Share right, please. Uh, yeah, because. Yeah, you have to share it right now. Okay, okay. Thank you. Brilliant. So um, today I'm going to speak to you about plastic waste management and especially uh, plastic waste to fuel conversion. Now, when we talk about green buildings, I think, you know, a lot of time people forget is the waste. The more people you have, the more waste we generate. And especially what happens is a plastic is, uh, you know, I always like to say plastic is a brilliant product. Lot of time, you know, we always want to say ban plastic, do, you know, stop plastic, but our life had changed because of plastic. You know, first revolution came, industrial revolution came because of the stainless steel. 
And I believe the second revolution, the retail revolution has come simply because of plastic. So it is not the plastic, it is just the way, you know, we disregard it because it is, uh, you know, much uh, volumetric, it's quite cost effective, it is inexpensive, it's widely used. So I think we do not give plastic the respect it deserves. So if we go and say this is what the reality of plastic is today, we must have seen, all of us have seen, you know, uh, 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 witnessed such things, you know, around us. And we, I think, read that, you know, we found some uh, plastic in a cow's stomach, have done this. So the last picture, you know, with the deer is something that actually, you know, changed the course of my life. Um, never thought I will come and work in a, a plastic waste management or start working on this. But, you know, look at this. Now, even the plastic has reached our wildlife. Uh, and it, it, the frightening thing is nearly all plastic that ever made exists today. I think Katya is going to speak to you about uh, plastic waste as well. But, you know, if we look at it, that out of the uh, 8.3 million metric tons of plastic has produced in last uh, six decades, only 9% has been recycled worldwide. Now we are the better in Indian contest because we have done it up to 26, 27% of plastic. See, because we have waste pickers in India who go and collect waste from various households, or they collect waste from the landfills and everything. And that actually, you know, that's how they have survived and that they have been the backbone for our waste management. And I'm so happy that in the last uh, uh, five, six years, things are changing in India. So, you know, instead of, uh, you know, we putting anything in a landfill, if we think of it as uh, a resource in a lot of us look at the waste as waste management but you know people like you can look at this as a resource and how the community can be built around it it will i think help not only clean but it will also help in working as a you know resource management because plastic are made from fossil fuel uh, it has almost the same energy as our diesel and uh, and, and uh, petrol so if we look at the plastic lying in our landfill, uh, as you can see around 79% of 8. Uh, you know, 3 million metric tons of plastic. Uh, and if we look at it as a resource, just look how much fossil fuel there is just lying in our landfill or in our nature. So why do we need the plastic waste management? It's simply because the amount we are using is huge. In India, we are only using 11 kilos per person per year, while the same figure is around 85 uh, kilogram uh, per year in uh, uh, USA. And the more resources we are using, the more plastic waste we are generating. And it's causing harm to our nature, uh, our animals. But thankfully, the new EPR rules are coming where the government is mandating people who use plastic will have to collect and uh, recycle it in an ethical way. And also Swaj Bharat Mission has a, had a very uh, you know, good impact on the way we look at the plastic waste. Right now, you know, there are different kinds of recycling happening. There is a mechanical recycling where people convert it into granules or it can convert it into yarn. And there is a chemical recycling where plastic is converted into fuel. That is the way what I do. So we have developed a technology which is called as thermocatalytic depolymerization. In this, actually what happens is we literally uh, convert the, uh, you know, reverse the plastic making uh, process, uh, wherein we use all kind of uh, uh, mixed plastic and convert it back into the mixture of, uh, uh, you know, various hydrocarbons. Now, uh, first we get a waste plastic, uh, which is then shredded to reduce the volume. Now it is fed into reactor and we add the catalyst. Now catalyst is, you know, we have developed in-house and this actually uh, helps uh, fasten the, uh, our uh, process and also uh, makes a fuel uh, uh, in a better quality. Now the heating starts, uh, the heating starts from our own fuel that is generated in the machine itself. 
uh, around 160, 180 degrees, plastic starts to melt. Now here we do not burn the plastic, but rather heat it and melt it. So the chemical reactions are different. Uh, now the gas and oil, you know, uh, uh, the, that comes out. And from uh, 330 degrees, we start to get the liquid fuel out. Now this liquid fuel is, uh, you know, can be again, uh, you know, used and can be filtered and can be used on a various ways. The gas actually can is a scrub. It's a mixture of various hydrocarbons again. So you get a methane, propane, thane, butane, which is clean and used for the uh, heating of the machine itself. The whole process actually uh, works on the gas and the fuel that is generated in this, you know, in machine. So it's a clean process. So this is what happens. We get all kind of a plastic, which is pre-processed. And through our TCD plant, we use it uh, in to convert it into uh, different kind of a fuel. Now you can see these are you know two color uh, uh, fuel. It's simply because the left hand side is from where there is a lot of MLPs and other stuff, and the right hand side is much more uh, you know uh, distilled as well. So the output on this is if you use a thousand kilos of plastic in the machine. We get anywhere between 50 to 75, so that is 500 to 750 liters of the liquid fuel. Now, there is a flammable gas which actually we used uh, in a closed fire system to heat the reactor. And there is a carbon black, which is a residue. Uh, it's, it's again, you know, it depends upon the uh, input of the plastic. And the brilliant thing about it is there is no emission because we capture all the gases. It's a much more cleaner fuel. Uh, it's, uh, you know, when we burn it, uh, the SOX NOX emissions are very, very low and it's energy efficient as well because it's a negative carbon uh, output as well. So the advantages of it is, you know, no need for a segregation because we can use all kind of a mixed plastic. Uh, again, we do not get a lot of PET, uh, you know, water bottles and other uh, PET stuff simply because there is a, a good recycling in India happens with the PET buckets. Now this, uh, you know, we actually can use it into the usable fuel, which we can uh, generate the electricity as well, or it can be used for the burning as well. It's actually uh, emission free, it eliminates the hazard. We actually are, you know, have uh, something small machine in Pune, which sits inside the, you know, city, and, uh, you know, there is no emission. We've been running that plant for more than three years. We have in a 50 yards under the building where the residents live and we still have no complaints. So there are no smells. There is no gas output. Uh, and, you know, um, it's a small demonstrative where we want to show that uh, decentralized machines can work where they can take care of, uh, you know, surrounding areas. We don't need to have or we don't need to build a huge machine where the whole city's plastic waste goes, but uh, rather have a smaller machine across because plastic is volumetric. The logistics are very expensive. And in this process, we actually convert hard to recyclable thin plastic, including MLPs, multi-layered, what we get it for our crisp and all that kind of a plastic into the fuel. Now, this helps waste pickers because right now there is no monetary value for the thin plastic. See, remember, even the small, you know, bottle of water is around 18 to 22 gram. So to make it a 1 kilo or a 10 rupees, they have to have a 56 to 60 bottles. But, uh, uh, you know, your biscuit wrapper is lesser than a half a gram. So to make it into the 1 uh, kilo, they need to bend down a lot. And they, again, do not get, you know, money for that plastic. So usually that is the plastic which ends up in a landfill. But we are trying to uh, create the monetary value for this thin plastic. And with this new EPR, it is helping us. And it will also help into the circular economy. So where can this plastic, uh, there can this oil be used? It is used in the uh, agricultural firm, furnace, generator, burner, boiler. Uh, one of our clients is using in a trawlers. Uh, we actually have tied up with more than 52 villages where we give them this uh, in to be used in the uh, cooking stove. 
so instead of uh, uh, yeah, you know instead of the uh, kerosene they use this uh, and we are also working to see whether we can you know where the villages can become uh, use this for the cremation because otherwise they use wood or they use tires. So we are trying to to see whether you know we can have the smarter villages as well because everybody talks about smart cities, but unless until we have smart villages, we are not going to have the smart cities as well. So advantage is basically it's a cleaner, greener fuel. We have, it's a calorific value is similar to diesel. So it can be used as a drop-in fuel. There is a gazette of petroleum ministry where they are looking at this as a drop-in fuel with the uh, diesel and petrol. And there is a huge demand. It can actually replace the furnace oil or the HDO, LDO as well. So there is a huge demand. We can't keep it up uh, with the demand in the market. The use of char is actually can uh, where we can mix that with the plastic and uh, that is mixed with the bitumen and uh, they can uh, use the road. Again, there is a ga gazette of a central government which mandates that, uh, you know, all kind of uh, uh, thing uh, can be uh, uh, used to make the roads. And a lot of, uh, you know, we are seeing a lot of uh, governments are starting to use this. Uh, for the laying of the road. The advantage of this is because of the plastic or the char into the bitumen, uh, the life of the road increases, there are less potholes, as well as the saving is around 30 to 35,000 rupees per square kilometers. So, you know, uh, people should start using this more. Uh, and I think we are seeing it with Pradhan Mandri Gram Sadak Yojana. Now, this is what we have been doing now. Yeah, the other thing are, you know, it is plastic is used in a crow processing in a cement lane or it can be upcycled. There are MLPs, people are using it in the pallets, making everyday items. Uh, we are also working with the CND uh, waste and see whether plastic can be converted into other things. Uh, see, there are a lot of innovations happening. Uh, I think uh, uh, packaging is getting different. A lot of companies have started using recycling material in the packaging. So a lot of things are happening uh, in terms of plastic waste in the worldwide. But to think that technology innovation will solve the problem is a fallacy because it doesn't happen. You can have a brilliant technology, but if people are not involved or if the, uh, you know, if the community is not involved, nothing happens. So that is why we actually, you know, do the uh, circular economy where we create awareness. We have started creating awareness through our NGO partners, and we do it through schools, colleges, offices, anywhere where we, uh, you know, tell people that they need to segregate at source, and uh, we have a collection system as well. So along with the technology, if we have a good awareness and an effective collection, I think, you know, the problem of plastic waste management, I think we'll be able to solve it. And we do the collection through our cars or, you know, in scooters, we do it through various things. So uh, thank you very much uh, for listening. But I would again say that to have the, uh, you know, any kind of, uh, uh, you know, buildings or anything, we really need to think about the waste as well. And we need to treat the waste as it is, you know, our problem. Uh, so thank you very much for inviting me today. Thanks. Yeah, Lina ji, you can go ahead and uh, sum it up and uh, introduce our next speaker. Okay, uh, our next speaker is Swati Ramanathan, but before I move on, I must say, Medha, that was a very interesting uh, presentation that you made on converting waste plastic to fuel. And I think there are not many who have said that plastic is a good material. Well, it just depends on how you use it and how it doesn't go into landfills and it could be uh, quite a useful material. Yes, we are all used to plastic. We've all used it. I mean, everywhere there's plastic. So that's a new, you know, way of looking at it. And I think what you opened up really as a thought, as a thought process was really interesting. Thank you, Mehran.
We'll uh, move on to our next presentation by Swati Ramanathan. Before that, I'll give you a small introduction to her, my fellow citizen in Bangalore. Uh, Swati Ramanathan is the co-founder of Jana Group, a clutch of social enterprises aimed at urban and transformation in India, including Jana Graha and Jana Urban Space. Her work encompasses practice as well as policy engagement with the government. Her practice work spans urban planning and design, as well as the innovative use of technology for civic change. Examples of her work include the preparation of the Jaipur Master Plan 2025 and the Sawai Madhopur Spatial Development Plan 2035. Mrs. Ramanathan pioneered the focus on urban road design with Tendashwa, which really stands for Specifications for Urban Utilities and Road Execution Guidelines, which has become the model for street designs in several Indian cities. I know it's been done in many streets in Bangalore, and I think it's a, it's, it's a wonderful design. And, you know, when you drive past the roads, you can always, you can just say by looking at it that this must be a tender sure road. It's wonderfully done. It's been conceived by her, and she has created two successful civic tech platforms. One of them is ipaidabribe.com to record instances of retail corruption in government services. And another one, ichangemycity.com, to enable hyperlocal civic engagement. She has authored the National Urban Spatial Planning and Development Guidelines for Planning India Cities at the behest of the Ministry of Urban Development, Government of India. In 2013, Mrs. Ramanathan was the co-convener of the Urban Planning Group for the Planning Commission and member National Advisory Committee for National Heritage Rejuvenation and Augmentation Yojana of the Government of India. Swati has received many recognitions for her work, including the Young Asian Leader by the Asia Society in 2007, the Social Entrepreneurs Award by Forbes India in 2013, the Democracy and Civic Innovator Award from the National Democratic Institute in Washington, D.C. in 2013. She writes regularly on urban issues in leading national and international journals. Most recently, her co-authored paper titled Balancing Environment, Economy and Equity, Planning Initiatives in Three Cities in Brazil, Mongolia and India, was presented at the IPHS 2018 Yokohama Urban Planning Conference. Mrs. Ramanathan holds a BS from India and an MS from the Pratt Institute, New York. She's a certified member of the AICP. Before her return to India in 1998, she worked in leading architecture and design firms in the US and the UK. She's a great influencer I know in Bangalore, which I've experienced. And it's a pleasure to have you with us, Swati. Over to you, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh... Yeah, I, you know, Dr. Mena's talk was very interesting and the value of recycling of waste and the high cost to the planet. Otherwise, I'm just reminded I recently saw a documentary called Seaspiracy. It's one of the most powerful documentaries I've seen, and I highly recommend it to everybody if you've not already watched it. Um, but be warned, you'll stop eating fish. Um, so it's a pleasure to be speaking on a topic that is so timely. And thank you to Jem for organizing this event and Nina and the rest of her team. And I just found out ASOCHAM is a 101 year old organization, which is quite remarkable. So my congratulations, there are not too many organizations of this vintage. And your contribution towards sustainability will only grow more relevant now than ever before. And this is because in the last couple of decades, it feels to me like a profound transformation is already underway. And that is, the concern to protect the earth has replaced the intention to destroy it. We had the nuclear threat of the Cold War that diminished thanks to Gorbachev's effects, uh, efforts. And then in some magical reciprocity environment, it, environment has now assumed the center stage. So I think that abuse of nature now will have a fallout to our own human well-being with loss of biodiversity, shifting chemical composition of air, weather disasters, floods, soil productivity, we are seeing this kind of change everywhere. And globally, we now also see more and more green parties, green policies, and a widening concern for the environment. 
that seems to suggest this is a dramatic shift that is here to stay, stay for at least for the next two decades. And the good news is that all the technical armory that was developed for purposes of war, like satellites and sensors, drones, AI, machine learning, this is all now going to be available for advances in addressing environmental challenges, challenges of clean water, clean air, clean energy, et cetera. So if I may request that my presentation be pulled up and um, you know, let me begin with introducing our work over the last two decades. I say our work, yes, this sure. is a joint journey with my husband, uh, Ramesh Ramanathan. We've built a clutch of institutions with a central focus on the transformation of cities around two key goals. Can we have the first slide, please? The first, uh, first goal one is to improve the quality of life in our cities, and this is quality of life for all. And we define quality of life as both the quality of our city's infrastructure and services, as well as the quality of active citizens in their democracy. The other goal is on inclusion, and this is for the lower socioeconomic segment of the population. And our focus on this is for financial inclusion and affordable housing. And our work towards both of these goals have been embedded have embedded within them the principles of sustainability in varying degrees and in different ways. And hopefully they will be self-evident. Um, so Jana um, Small Finance Bank provides a range of banking products for the underserviced, uh, both on the consumer side as well as for micro and nano enterprises. And it currently serves about four and a half million families. We employ about 15,000 people who are from this segment. And it is pretty much present across the country in about 500 locations. Janadar again is a social uh, enterprise and it is focused on actually developing affordable housing for the economically weaker sex section, the EWS, the LIGA and the LIGB uh, segment. We've delivered about 1500 homes to families in two cities so far, and we're now moving to the next phase in, in building affordable housing with sustainable building principles. Janakraha works with citizens to deepen democratic participation. And it also works with governments on reforms that improve participation, transparency in the product of government to citizens, as well as their accountability. The last one uh, under which the project that I'm going to talk about is Jana Urban Space. This institution focuses on spatial transformation of our cities, the geography of sustainability at three levels. At the micro level, it is linked to buildings in a neighborhood, housing, commercial and retail establishments, schools, health clinics. Then there are the spaces in between, and that's, this is the second level, to service the local communities there in the neighborhoods, the streets, the parks, the playgrounds, plazas, markets, waterfronts. These need urban design. If you can go to the next slide, please. At the macro level of the city, the clusters of communities that make a settlement need larger infrastructure, services that need master plans, metros, highways, hospitals, industrial estates, etc. Could you move to the next slide, please? Okay, so you've moved one step a little further. Can you move back? So this is Jana Urban Space, and we, as you can see, the three levels, the micro to the in-between, and then the macro, the, the, the local buildings, the neighborhoods, and the cities. So the quality of your life in your city and neighborhoods, move to the next slide. Actually, move to the next slide. We'll come back to this. Oh, we skipped a slide. Oh, it's not showing up. Well, um, so let me just speak to it. This should have had for you, uh, uh, you know, an image of a city and, you know, what, what is what you can see as above is visible and that which is below as invisible. The quality of our lives as citizens in our cities and neighborhoods is essentially assessed in, in the visible ways. It manifests in how safe we feel, how easy is it to, to travel around? Do we have opportunities for healthy activities? Are there general stores, groceries, good schools, parks, playgrounds, healthcare for aged parents, affordable housing, which we have, which we can rent, even for the middle class, which we can rent or own. These are all the visible impact of what we can say of, of, from out of projects. But there's still the tip of the iceberg. The scaffolding that supports them are the vis invisible plans 
if you can keep pressing, you'll, you, I think it's, it's on a delayed thing. So keep pressing. Uh, the plans that protect our environment, the plans, the laws that in, ensure, you know, a sustainability, resilience, etc. And for all of these, like the telecom revolution, I think our cities need to leapfrog from outdated and old to the new and the progressive. Um, the earlier slide actually showed uh, uh, the wings of a butterfly, and essentially that's our uh, theory of change for the organizations, both Janagraha and Jana USP. And what we say is that the four wings represent essentially the four aspects of our theory of change. The first is urban planning and urban design, and the city must grow with thoughtful planning and design. The second is that it must have adequate resources to thrive. That is financial resources because if the development has to develop, if the city has to develop infrastructure, government needs the finances. It needs the right kind of officers and the human resources. The third is that communities must be represented through robust electoral processes, and this is a non a sine qua non for a democratic setup. And finally, that citizens must have a continuing participatory role to play, even in between elections, in local issues of both development as well as social issues, social health. And the policy thinking for both Janagraha and Jana USP, if you can move forward, is informed by our doing on the ground and also vice versa, that when we do on the ground, it informs how we recommend policies. So we call ourselves not think tanks, but do tanks, do tanks that actually think. So with this as a kind of a broad general group, group background, let me go into the evolution of Tender Show, which is our Street 3 design initiative and the showcase project for this presentation. And I will end with a, a bit of a five minute video of the project uh, and come back with a couple of slides after that. But the genesis of this, Around the year 2009, 2010, I remember coming out of talking at yet another conference on mobility. This was in Bangalore. And it seemed to me that all we ever did was talk about the problems and have views about the solutions, whether it should be BRTS or Metro Rail or Mono Rail, et cetera. And nothing much really changed on the ground. And so I came out of the conference and as I stood outside waiting for my car, resolving never to participate in these events again, there was my aha moment right in front of me because I saw the road jammed with traffic, vehicles of all types, cars, buses, bikes, autos. And I was standing on a footpath that was utterly broken. It was fully uneven, unwalkable for transformers, trees, etc. The drains had black sewage, water leaking out into the road. There were data cables hanging from everywhere. It was complete chaos. It was very much like our democracy, right? Messy and kind of uh, chaotic. And yet in that nice conference room, we were talking about designing BRTS, MRTS, when we could actually not even, we haven't even gotten our roads right. And so to me, that was the genesis of Tender Show, Tender Specifications for Urban Roads Execution. But even beyond, can you move the slides forward, please? May I request whoever is in control of this? Even beyond the emotional reasons, it made immense sense to actually focus uh, on fixing the roads. Um, I'm going to see if I can pull up this presentation on my. Is it possible? Ah, oh, there you go. Uh, because 20%, if you look at our urban roads, if you look at roads and streets, they actually occupy 20% of the urban space. And if you look at the non built up, not the buildings area, it's 40%. It has, it is the most prolific allocation of space in the city is given to roads. Second, because it is the most democratic, it's the most equitable use of space because every socioeconomic group within and the groups within communities use this. It is also not just a mobility network. It is not just for transportation. It allocates, if you look at the city's budget, about 80% of the city's budgetary allocation on water supply, sewage, drainage, uh, power, uh, uh, OFCs, all of this, street lights, all of this is networked through the roads. It's all happening under the roads. It's just invisible again. And because it's the first mile from my home and the last mile to my destination, it's very important. And most important because it's not that you have to have a magic wand that fixes the whole problem at a shot. You can actually do it one stitch at a time. And that makes it very amenable to budgetary constraints that every city obviously has. Next slide, please. 
So how to streets and sustainable communities? And to me, this is at the end of the day, we are, if we don't solve the problem of local, we can't go global, you know? So local is where all of the action, the theater of any change happens at the local level in the communities. So how does a well-designed street space become an unparalleled first step? Well, because it gives you access into your dwellings into what your offices, your workplaces, your wherever you're going. It gives you the porosity of your movement in your neighborhoods that make allow you to you know, move around in a convenient and safe manner. It provides for emergency ambulances, fire services, etc. come right there on your roads. Your micro mobility, which is taking the world by storm, especially during Corona, nobody wants to, you know, people have started investing in walking, cycling. These are all non-polluting, they're healthy. The five minutes across the globe again, it's become 10 minute city, 15 minute city, five minute city. Well, even if it's 15 minute city, to be able to get to a public transportation network, the road's the one that actually takes you there from the local, from your home to, to the, to the, uh, to the um, uh, public transportation system. You get your parking, your e-charging, all of these new technologies that are coming, shared bike services, curbside delivery stops, you know, with all of our, uh, uh, Dunzos and uh, Swiggies and everybody and drones more and more during COVID people started using drones. Street vendors where we go to do our shopping, our urban trees in our neighborhoods, they get leafy, shaded, green parts, etc. all held on trees. Our drainage, when the rainwater comes in, they get taken away on our streets into, into the swales, etc. and then go into our lakes. Similarly, our network utilities, everything I already told you lies beneath. And finally, they provide the places for communities to gather. You know, the third spaces that we talk about, the little nooks and corners where moms gather on playgrounds, children gather in parks. These are all held in that local community and everything is serviced by the road. Move forward, please. I'm going to, I think this is the video and then I'll end with that with a couple of slides after that. This is Bangalore. If the volume can be increased in the video. Can we have the volume for the video if possible? I think volume might not. Rishi, the, will the volume play here in the PPT? Volume, uh, video can be played differently. If we can get the video or working, then I think we should begin, start from the beginning. We are not able to get the volume. I mean, this PPTX, uh, the video, the audio will not be. Uh, we cannot hear the audio. But it is a separate video. It can be. Maybe uh, Swati, if you could share this, then maybe, you know, as a audio video document, I think what he has is just as a PPT. So maybe you can give a sharing rights. Yeah, if you have the video separately, I we think can uh, what I can do is, if you don't mind, I'll just play it. Yeah. If you can play it from the beginning, I'll start it from the beginning. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Can you play the video? Uh, Reggie, keep playing the video, please. What I'll do is I'll give you the volume and then you can give the video. So. Okay, you are okay. Okay, okay. get to it. Start.
code is actually the conduit for all the other networks which impact my quality of life. That's the underground network which is supposed to collect all the rainwater and prevent flooding. That's the one which brings in my water supply, power, data cables, etc., and carries out my sewage. So the road becomes this conduit which networks the entire city. So today the municipality comes and lays the road. We have multiple agencies waiting in the background. They seem to wait until the road is laid by the municipality, then come and dig it up one by one by one. So you're back to square one. That road will be with the lean was done at six months ago. Einstein said insanity is doing the same thing over and over, but expecting a different result. Then the show fixes the design of the road itself, but also the design of the utility corridors. Every agency has been allocated a utility corridor with regular access chambers under the footpaths. No agency should dig the roads anymore. We started with saying no more of build poorly, cut repeatedly, rebuild poorly. Instead, let's aim for cut once and fix once we for all. Tender sure seemed to be a very good thing because for the first time we were looking at urban roads with much higher and better specifications, which would be more sustainable. This is change that people can see. It dramatically improves their quality of life. It improves the walkability, revitalizes their neighborhoods, improves safety and security. It just improves the experience of the states. I believe that urban India, at least as far as the roads and cities are concerned, should be a completely different picture if tender sure specifications and tender sure model becomes the basis for road making. I think it's a big leap for People asked, why such wide footpaths? Why has the road surface reduced? Well, it's like Banali's principle. If you put plenty of water in a wide funnel, it will still drip slowly at the pinched end of the funnel. So also, if you let in 100 cars at the widest part of the road, but only 10 can go at the narrowest, we have not eased traffic. We've simply created a traffic jam. Our city roads are filled with such traffic jams. What we have done in Tennis Shore is designed for the narrowest part of the road and given the rest for parking, bus space, it has dramatically improved the flow of traffic. And in spite of zero land acquisition, we have protected all the old trees in this project. We have provided space to accommodate the same number of street walkers. I'm working as a project partner in this project. This project is uh, first of its kind uh, project in India. So it has really inspired us. And uh, we have learned a lot of things from this project. Um, if you can just go to the next, I have just a couple more slides if, uh, if I can just quickly go through this. Where we are today is that uh, initially there was, I think, and I think this is true for every change maker. I mean, the, if you're ambitious for change and if you have a radical idea, you're going to get into a lot of hot water as well. And so I think that part of the challenge for us was to, uh, 
to overcome the initial amount of criticism because it was a new project. It was something that was dramatically different. We had literally ripped open the guts of the road. But today, if you look at it, where we are, this tender shore is extremely popular with the public. Just about everybody wants a tender shore in their neighborhoods, in their, uh, you know, their homes, in their offices. Scale. I think that the, one of the biggest things that every change maker wants to see is that if a pilot must grow, the replicability and the scalability must be evident. And that actually has, again, the scale of it has grown dramatically. We went from the first pilot, which we delivered in 2016, to 50 more roads in Bangalore and across the state. And 15 other cities have now taken over, taken up Tendershore uh, projects and smart under smart streets, et cetera, which has been introduced by the government of India. The World Bank has uh, introduced it as one of their benchmark standards. The ecosystem too has expanded. You have more and more. It's an entire sector, infrastructure sector has been created out of redevelopment of urban roads. So from one contractor now, you have so many contractors who are now getting engaged and understanding how to do these roads from all of the level of services that we have. Several design consultants, several PMCs. So the ecosystem has grown dramatically. Next slide, please. And school children, if you look at all of the parameters, it's safe, it's pedestrian experience, walking, cycling, people park, behavior changes. People start parking where there's designated parking is allowed. This was a garbage. This is where the garbage used to get dumped. And look at it today, there's a fountain there. Greening landscapes, communities started greening their landscapes because we gave green strips, etc. Investment also a dramatic redevelopment effort in all of the private buildings that are everywhere. People are actually redeveloping. Prices have increased, which is simply because the road improved. Next slide, please. And the best part is the communities. They, you know, started owning these streets. They no longer, it was no longer about my, you know, you, we heard these stories, right? I only care about what's in my city because I have no power over anything that's outside. Now you find that there's a dramatic amount of uh, ownership. And what is involved, though, in bringing about systemic change? And I, I would say that, and I'll end with this. I think one of the biggest things, problems that we have is we don't have standards in our country for anything. I mean, and as GEM looks to start supporting, you know, initiatives, et cetera, one of the things that you need to look at is to say, when we talk about sustainability in all of the aspects that, in, in, in all of the areas that you feel passionately that GEM wants to get involved in, do you have the right kind of standards? Because I think that is the starting point. The second one is the procurement processes. The, the right kind of procurement process that gets you the right qualified contractors at the right price and that give you the give you timely execution as well. The third is operational efficiency in implementation. And here you find that in public projects, especially you have issues of graft, engineers with power and very large egos. It's entirely a male dominated uh, cabal, lack of capacity within the system. And finally, getting the community buy in for any kind of radical surgery, you know, to get them oriented. And here you need to work with the media as well. And, you know, hopefully media will be your friend and not your foe in this. But if you have no pain, you really have no gain. So the break once and fix once and for all kind of a thing. And finally, nothing works like a pilot to showcase the concept. The pilot is your first starting point because that's the ribbon cutting that the political system gets convinced in and then they take it forward because they start seeing the merit in it. So thank you so much and uh, wish you all the best for the next 100, 100 years. Thanks, Lena. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Swati. I think, you know, what I can say, um, Swati is from Bangalore and we've all seen the great work that she's doing. And what I, I must say is, you know, while most of us always complain about things not being right about um, everything, the roads being bad and everything that's bad. None of us really get down to doing anything, but she remains a person who has not just sat down to complain, but she's actually, you know, taken it on and she has got solutions to it. She has worked at it and she has worked towards um, solving and improving what all of us are always complaining about. And I believe that takes great strength. And uh, Swati, you make it sound so easy, you know, to deal and transition between the private and uh, dealing with the government. I, I believe you have the greatest perseverance for it, the faith, the belief, and I admire you for that. 
also, I think one of the things that you did say is about, you know, working at the micro level and the macro level. And yes, if each one of us really worked at the micro level at spaces close to us, places that we can do something. I mean, we even have our what committees and if all of us really got involved in it. I believe we can do something. It's hard. It's really hard. But listening to you makes it feel like it's uh, possible. And anyway, what's not hard today? If you want to make change, it doesn't come easy. And change is what matters. And I think that's how our country is going to grow. If each one of us put in some effort towards a better place for all of us. So thank you, Swati. That was a great presentation. And I think it also motivates every one of us to do whatever we can at whatever level we can. Thanks, Lena. Thank Thanks. you. Uh, we'll move on to our next uh, presenter. That is uh, Katja Burnett. To give you a small introduction about her. Katja, I hope I'm pronouncing it correct. Burnett is an architect at the internationally operating manufacturer of textile membranes, Nehla Technologies. As a partner of planners of tensile architecture all over the world, Katja closes the gap between product developers and architects engineers. In this role, she works together with many of the leading design and engineering offices. Her material consultancy reaches from the planner's first sketches over to the realization. Before joining Mahila Technologies, Kay Burnett worked for German architects, Von Gurkhan, Mark and Partners, GMP, working on roof structures of Berlin Olympic Stadium and the World Cup Arena in Frankfurt. She gained planner's experience in the field of tensile architecture. Her technical expertise was deepened when she joined the coating industry. In the context of textile architecture, Katja is internationally invited as lecturer, workshop instructor, and into scientific committees of symposia. Besides, she's an author of scientific papers and articles. She studied at the Technical University in Aachen, RWTH, and at the Bartlett School of Architecture in London, UK. She's founding member and co-chairman of the International Industry Association, AMA, Architectural Membrane Association, member of the Institute for Membrane and Shell Technology, IMS, and of TENSI-NET, European Network for Tensile Structures. She's a listed member of the Chamber of Architects. Now Lena is off. Maybe I'm on. Um, yeah, yeah, you can be on. Yeah, okay. I think there are some video questions. Yeah, please. Thank you very much. Well, even if Lena can't hear me now, uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction. And here I am. Uh, I'm Katya. Uh, I'm an architect, as many of you. And um, Lena just said that I'm a member of the Chamber of Architects, which is obviously the German Chamber. Uh, but it could be the Indian as well. So it's, uh, you know, it's us architects here together. And I'm really, really honored to be part of your conference. I feel uh, very happy uh, to be uh, part of this round and uh, part of these very prestigious uh, speakers. And I was so, so uh, happy uh, to hear all the content so far. And I hope I can contribute at least a bit. Uh, to the uh, to the, to the uh, sustainability content in the next 10 to 15 minutes or 10, I'd say, and I'm doing this on behalf of my Indian colleagues. So you see me here as a German. I'm obviously uh, well, not not Indian, which is a shame, really. But uh, I am in Germany and I'm uh, a European uh, architect, and I'm doing this on behalf of my Indian colleagues who are. Mena Technologies people as well, but who are not architects. So I'm the only architect in the lot. That's why they asked me uh, to get into your round of architects. And I'm very honored and uh, very happy to be here. Uh, but I, I can tell you that I have a couple of very, very nice colleagues in India, in Delhi, in Noida, uh, more precisely, and in other uh, Indian um, country, uh, cities. And if you've got a question, you can contact me directly or uh, you can ask them. Mela Technologies is at several places in India, 
and we're doing membranes. And whenever you've got a question concerning Tesla architecture, just ask us. But I'm I'm uh, concentrating here with my little presentation. Uh, I'm concentrating on facades. And because we're talking about sustainability here, I'm talking mainly about our fabric, which is made of PET bottles, upside the PET bottles. And in this, uh, I'm, I'm sort of uh, in the continuity of Mida, Dr. Mida's uh, presentation, which I love really, because uh, I think uh, uh, calling plastic a brilliant material is perfect because it's, it, it, it could be our marketing speech um, because we are doing plastics and plastic is fantastic. And um, well, it, it's a PVC coated polyester, which we're doing. And um, it's basically a material with perfect uh, properties for what we're doing textile architecture. And I share my screen now um, for you to have a grasp of what I'm actually talking about. I, I'm going to show you a couple of um, a couple of slides uh, with with examples. I hope that you can see my screen now. Oh, is this okay? Yeah. Yeah, not yet. Yeah, just a bit. okay. Fine. So I'm talking about uh, our TF400 uh, material. TF400 is the name of our bestseller in in facade. And what you can see behind me uh, is not the place where I'm sitting. It is the facade which is in Cincinnati, and it's the same facade which you can see in this presentation in the first slide. It's done with the TF400 facade material, but this is a standard material. Uh, we now did it as a sort of a green version with recycled PET bottles. Uh, we, this is Mela Technologies, we are weaving with polyester yarns, we are coating with uh, PVC, and uh, of course we have developed this material uh, for decades. We, we are very experienced in, in doing um, coated fabrics, and we are the ones who have a lacquer, uh, which is very, very good in terms of durability and in terms of cleanability. And this is just one of the features which make us special, but the one which makes us very special in terms of sustainability uh, is the fact that we are the only ones in this industry, at least so far, which is a shame really, but we are the only ones so far which use PET bottles, upcycled PET bottles uh, for making new fabrics. And uh, we are part of the Freudenberg Group. This is a big German company, um, which is based in India too. So uh, we um, benefit from them being um, very, very experienced in recycling of PET bottles too. So they are doing all sorts of materials uh, out of used PET bottles, and we uh, use this for our fabrics. This is a close up of this here 400 mesh. Uh, which you can use for facades. And uh, at the moment, we have it uh, as a black material, but we're going to do more uh, white material because white is actually the standard. Um, but um, it's not only uh, focused on our textile architecture range. We're doing much more fabrics like tarpaulins, ten fabrics and all these sorts. And we are planning to do more and more out of recycled polyester yarns. Well, uh, this is uh, for the experts, for the engineers, the architects, um, to, to see that the standard version of our TF400 material is, is uh, just more or less the same as the green version. That's to say, we managed to have the same properties with the recycled yarns as we have in the uh, in the normal standard material, which is good because then architects and clients can use either one material. And of course, we'd recommend to use the more sustainable one, the uh, the one which is made of recycled fabrics, because our responsibility is it not only to have an, uh, a material which is recyclable, but also to have uh, uh, a lesser use of raw material in the first place. So using used PET bottles and then at the end of life, which is after 30, 40 years, recycling the same material and bringing it again into a cycle uh, of um, raw material is the optimum for, for us. So this is the different facade fabrics we got. As I said, low bottom uh, on, on the left is the best seller, the TF400. 
and then uh, I, uh, yes i got you uh, yeah excuse me like your ppt is not available i mean uh, it's not uh, visible i mean uh have you shared the ppt or yes i am working so so you, you you see it now no, no I... not yet i mean can you just share and share it again okay just we are able to hear you but you cannot see the presentations so okay you can share it Just one minute. Okay, okay you see it now? Yes. Right now we can take it. Say okay. You can make full screen noises. Okay. It's a shame really because uh, so you haven't seen any of my presentations so far. No, no, not yet. No, okay, no, no. I just, uh, because then I just show you the pictures to the many words I have okay. <laughs> uh, so far. So this is uh, the weaving part, this is the coating part. This is our special nano coating, the lacquering. This is the used PET bottles. This is Freudenberg, the company we belong to. And uh, this is a close up of, of the material I'm talking about. This is the butter sheet. And now here I am uh, talking about uh, the different facade meshes we got. Um, we got the TF100 on the left bottom side, which is the one which we now have as a recycled material. And there's another a unique selling point here on the top right side because uh, this is a very open mesh, which is good when it comes to um wrecking uh parking garages for example because this counts as an open facade it's 50 percent open that means you don't need any ventilation inside uh, you can have it uh, as you have an open uh, building with cars uh, parked inside so uh, this is just a, a side step so to say uh, but it says at the same time that uh, working or um, creating with fabrics means that we are using a sustainable material in the first place anyway, even without having uh, recycled uh, yarns in, 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 in the material, but having, but using fabrics in the first place is using a very light and very efficient material because with a minimum of uh, raw material, uh, a minimum of weight, you can cover huge spaces, not only stadia or facades, but all sorts of metro stations, um, other stations, railway stations, all these sorts of things. And uh, this makes us sort of uh, sustainable uh, right from the start, but we are not, we, are, we, we didn't do anything for that. So it's just us having the material for lightweight architecture. But then uh, it was our next step to provide fabrics which are made of recycled material. And there are very many steps ahead. And, and of course, we are looking at the, the coating as well. But our step here is providing fabric, which is made of 100% PET bottles uh, in, the, in the polyester yarn. So we are not using raw material, new raw material. We're taking what we got and what, for example, Dr. Mida collected with her uh, teams uh, in India or elsewhere in the world. So uh, this is again the close-up on the left-hand side of the TF400 and on the right-hand side, the TF600. This is the strongest facade material we got. And of course, we will provide these facade meshes in a couple of different colors. These are the standard colors. And of course, you can have all sorts of customized colors as well. Uh, whenever there is a project you are thinking of, just uh, ask us, our colleagues in India, or, or me, or us in head office directly, and we're gonna uh, help you uh, to find the right material for your, for your project. This is a project in Cincinnati, which you can see in my background as well. It's done with the TF400, unfortunately not with the, uh, the green version. This is the standard version. And uh, we're still looking for more case studies with the TF400 green, with the sustainable material. And whenever you've got a project, please go ahead um, and tell our colleagues in India, because uh, uh, at the moment, even if we got this material for a year already, we are still uh, looking to spread the news more and more and to, to have uh, more of these case studies with the recycled material. Again, another case study of the same material, in this case, it's, it's grayish colors in Miami, in USA. It's, both of these projects are done by StructureFlex. This is the US customers of ours. And here's an Indian project. Uh, again, it's a standard material, but uh, it's, it's black. So um, if this 
this uh, project was done a bit later. It could have been done with the TF100 green version, that's the same as the 100% uh, recycled fabric. Uh, in this case, it's a standard version, but nonetheless, it's a way, it shows very, uh, very well how you can, with a, only a couple of uh, uh, panels, you can uh transform a facade from a standard facade into something special and this is what the consultant mr sandeep uh, narang did in this case and uh, i know that mr narang is in the gem um, um, um initiative as well so uh together with him we hope to push this forward and to have many more of these kinds of facades not only in delhi but in other indian countries uh, indian cities uh, and areas as well so this is uh, a version with a printed uh, example, and of course you can. It, it just uh, it's just meant to show how versatile this material is. Um, printing different sorts of open areas and these sorts of things, and all could be done uh, at least with the green version of the TF four hundred with the um, recycled fabric. Uh, another uh, example of prints on the fabric. And um, here is a very, uh, well, we're very honored and pleased to be able to show that we won an award with this uh, product. Uh, AMA uh, is the Architectural Membrane Association. It's for all companies involved into tensile architecture, not only fabrics, but in this case, foils as well. And this is a new award which was launched this year. And we are very proud that we won the prize for the best product, the best sustainable product for this year's um, edition of the award. Um, well, uh, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention, especially in this format. And I'd love to be in India myself, uh, and I'm looking forward to being uh, there for, the, for your next conference. I'm really, be, really very keen on seeing what uh, Jem uh, and you are doing uh, in the future, because I, I think it, it's just a wonderful uh, uh, thing uh, to, to go in this direction. And I'm personally, as an architect, and personally as Katya, so to say, I'm, I'm very um, uh, enthusiastic about not only about tensile architecture, but about uh, the sustainability aspects. And I'm, I'm keen on, on looking at what you're doing in the future and, and would be uh, loving uh, being part of this too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Katja. Well, I just like to ask you one question. What you really shown is a fabric mesh. So it's it's not uh, it's not watertight. I mean, it's it's a mesh. It's no, I, I concentrated on meshes uh, in this case. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, these meshes are usually uh, uh, used for facades. Um, but, of course, mainly we are doing watertight membranes. We are doing uh, solids uh, like, like fabrics, uh, um, well, more or less one kilo uh, of weight per square meter. And then you cover metro stations, railway stations, football stadiums, cricket stadiums. There are a couple of beautiful examples in India. Uh, the one which is most prominent um, is uh, in, in uh, the green and white cricket stadium in Lucknow, um, which, uh, which is uh, beautifully designed uh, and, and it's got a green and white roof. So um, whenever you see a membrane in India, it's, it could be our membrane or it's most likely our membrane. Uh, and um, well, this is what we are usually doing. Uh, but here in this context, I thought it's it's uh, uh, important to show what we're doing in facades, especially because we're doing this recycled fabric in the facade range. Okay, so even your uh, tensile fabrics are also made out of recycled material, or that that isn't? You mean you know for shelters and a part of these fabrics are already done with recycled fabrics. Um, mostly uh, the the more um performance material side so protapolines um from uh, uh, membranes for agricultural uses biogas uh, um plants these sorts of things in the architectural range we we were quite um sensitive till now because 
uh, architectural fabrics have the highest uh, level of uh, quality because they got to last for 30, 40 years. And that's why till now we we were very cautious when when it came to using PET bottles or, or like uh, recycled raw materials. But uh, given the current situation or the, the prominent situation with climate crisis and all these, you know, these very, very prominent uh, questions we are facing at the moment, um, we thought, no, we can't wait long any longer to, to, to have probably better recycled material or better uh, coatings or better whatever. No, we are doing it right now. And, and this is what I loved uh, in the last presentation as well. Um, because it, it's about doing something. It's about providing a material which is not all new, but which uses a recycled material. So this is our first step. And we as Mela Technologies are very, very keen on doing more steps in the same direction. So not only replacing the fabric, but replacing the coating as well and using um, recycled material for the coating. So this, this is obviously the next step. And then, uh, we can widen this for the whole portfolio and use, hopefully we can use, we, we can replace the new material uh, with recycled material altogether. So this is the aim uh, which, we are, which we are heading for, but this is gonna be a long way, so to say, but we're stepping, uh, we're going one step. After In the that. right direction. Yes. So, okay, before we conclude, let me ask you one question. What is the best use of your fabric mesh that you have used as an architectural facade, what would you say is, is the, your best usage? Well, the, the one which is, you can see in my background is actually my, 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 the, the, my, my best uh, example because it's, it's three-dimensional. Uh, I love this facade because it's not only panels, it's not only flat, but it's three-dimensional. And the fabric actually wants to be a saddle shape. It doesn't, it, you know, it works very well in, in plain fabrics, uh, in fabric facades, but in roofs, for example, in horizontal applications, you 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 want to have cell shapes, and this is what uh, the the designers of this facade, which you can see in my background in the Cincinnati Medical Center, uh, put into the vertical uh, mm -hmm. facade, having cell shapes here as well. And this, that's what I like. It, it's very three dimensional, and um, that's what fabrics are for. Uh, and that's what we love in fabric. At least I'm. Uh, <laughs> right. Thank you very much for asking. <laughs> okay, so just one more thing. You know what you've used over here. The main function of it is shade, or is it cutting down on pollution? Or it uh, is. Uh, you're absolutely right. The main function is shade. So uh, we feel that, especially in countries like India, with lots of sun, you, you, you can improve the comfort in, in the inside of the buildings a lot by using this kind of uh, permanent sunshade. But uh, you are right as well when, you, when it comes to pollution. Of course, these meshes have a filtering effect as such. A mesh is a filter. And that helps the comfort of the city, not only when it comes to pollution, but also the acoustical comfort is, is, is much better when having these meshes. You know, imagining you, you've got more, more of these kinds of wrap buildings in your urban spaces. And then another aspect is that you can put on top of our coating, you can put another lacquering, which is filtering NOx. And this is something which is, of course, uh, which makes our cities more sustainable as well. And we are really looking forward to having uh, a case study with this special coating uh, or NOx filtering lacquer in India, for example, uh, because this is a collaboration with the University in Aachen, um, which we did. And um, there is an example in Germany, which has a facade of this NOx filtering uh, material on top of uh, the, the the mesh, the fabric mesh, and it's it, it's absolutely measurable that the air uh, behind this screen is better than uh, on the on on the street just a couple of meters in front. So um, imagining this uh, this in a city like Delhi uh, with a lot of pollution, uh, it would be absolutely worthwhile testing this and trying to improve uh, the, the comfort in the city and the air quality in the city. Yes, yes, it would. Okay, thank you, Katja. Thank you for your presentation. <laughs>
I think I'll hand it over to Shubh. Yeah, so thank you, thank you, Linaji, for conducting uh, the session so uh, gracefully. And uh, yeah, there are a lot of things uh, we we heard from Medhaji, Swatiji, and Kajaji, and Bindi is going to wrap it up. Yeah, before we move to the uh, vote of thanks, and uh, I would like to invite Rosni ji to say a few words about uh, our uh, special artist, special guest about uh, Deepak ji and Avinash ji, and we'd like to hear from him from her. Is there any news or any messages from our, our special guests? Uh, thank you, Shob. Uh, we had uh, two special guests today. Uh, Sri Deepak uh, Kesarkar, who is a member of the Legislative Assembly, also a uh, former Minister of State for Finance uh, uh, and Home and Planning. Uh, and also we had Mr. Avinash uh, Patil, Director of Town Planning and uh, Chief Planner, Maharashtra Industrial Development Corporation. Unfortunately, both of them uh, had uh, uh, have asked them to be excused because of the uh, various situations. Mr. Patil was called for a special meeting in the Mansala and he was on his way also. He was trying to connect, but uh, he could not. Uh, and uh, Mr. Uh, Kesarka simply could not connect because of uh, travel. So uh, both have, have excused themselves, but I will just read out uh, uh, Mr. Patil has said um, uh, 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 apologies for not being able to join, uh, but we will have an interactive session after a week as uh, the directorate have formed the group on sustainable urban development and uh, besides many other groups that have been formed uh, for this. Take so uh, apologies, but uh, I hope that we can take this forward with them. They both have uh, got the message of uh, our conclave and hope we can hopefully take uh, things forward with them. Thank you. Over to you, Shubh. Really great. And I would like to, uh, I mean, there is no need of apologies. It's fine. And uh, yeah, there is a lot of responsibilities uh, on their head. So we would like to move forward with our vote of thanks to uh, Bindiji. Uh, slide, please. Yeah. Good evening. One minute, ma'am. Yeah, sure. Yes, yes. Please go ahead. Yeah, so our uh, Bindi ji is the co chairperson of Associate Jam Karnataka chapter and founding partner architect of Solo Proctor and Associates. So she will be illuminating us with the complete, you know, concluding remarks and vote of thanks. So we'd like to hear from you, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, good evening to everyone. It is my privilege of offering the vote of thank today's SHM Jam event. With SHM Jam Karnataka today, we cover yet another significant milestone of collaborations and opportunities. And with a renewed zeal, we make a pledge towards creating awareness about the green environment and express our gratitude to our collaborating partners, SHMGM Maharashtra chapter for joining hands with us for their wholehearted participation in making today's session a most successful one making today's collaborative event most successful and giving its significance are our today's guest, Shri Deepak Kesarkar, Honorable Member of Legislative Assembly Government of Maharashtra. He could not be present, but because of extreme tight schedule, but his dedication of sustainability is known to all of us. Our, uh, my next thanks goes to our Karnataka Commissioner, Housing Commissioner, Shri D.S. Ramesh, for kindly accepting, accepting our invite as a guest of honor and extending us with a support by gracing the occasion. Your cost effectiveness point has been noted by us. Sir, your presence today encourages us in reaching the message to sustainability and green movement for further deeper into the society and the government. Shri Avinash Patil, yes, Director MIDC, was also not available, but we are indeed grateful for his encouragement and lending strength of our SHM GEM moment. My grateful thanks to Dr. Medha Tatpatrikar, Director Manta Research and Consultants Private Limited, for your insights and ideas you, gener uh, you generously shared in adding to the knowledge. It was very enlightening to hear you, Dr. Medha. Our special thanks to Shri R. K. Gautam, Director, Director for Sustainability, Kushman and Wakefield for kindly being there today with us 
and for your contribution of ideas and thoughts on sustainability, which has made us more aware today and widened our understanding on sustainability. To the co-founder of Janagraha Center for Citizen and Democracy, Mrs. Swami Ra Swati Ramanathan, thank you very much for your kind words and contribution. The ideas you brought out today are most relevant to the JM movement and Janagraha, as we know, has been at the forefront on campaign for citizen and democracy in Karnataka. We have had a very special guest from Germany, architect Katya Bernhardt of Mehler Technologies, who has given our moment support by her presence and who shed new lights on sustainability, sharing her ideas, valuable experience. We thank you, architect Katya, for your gracious presence and ideas which made a difference today. Ladies and gentlemen, we would have had a big round of applause for our all guests today if we were offline. Today's event is the first of its kind, but one that sets the ball rolling for many such collaboration in spreading FHMGM philosophy to every professional, practitioner and academician. This was a brainchild of our chairman FHMGM, Shri Pankaj Dharkar, who envisaged this collaborative event and has stuck put together along with our SHM Joint Director, Shri Shubha Shubhratha Ratha and Neera Charora, Senior Director, Head for GEM Certification Program. Our heartfelt thanks to you both for the wonderful ideas and event taking to success. I like to place on record our appreciation with a big thanks to Maharashtra chapter SHM JM chapters for coming together with SHM Karnataka in organizing this collaborative effort on sustainability. This would not have been possible without synchronized efforts and initiative taken by SHM JM Maharashtra team led by architect Vilas Auchar, chairman, and Roshni Ji, co chair Maharashtra JM chapter. Thank you very much, Roshni and Vilas sir. We at SHM JM Karnataka are in a fully appreciation of you and your team members. At Bangalore, SHM JM is led by our own and able chairperson, architect Lina Kumar, who is a great pleasure to work and interact with always. Lina, a big thank you for your, all your efforts. You always rock and appreciate that you are always there for us. And my congratulations and thanks to present here in this very intellectual get together for being part of this very relevant and important moment of GEM. A big, big thank is due to my all colleagues at Karnataka, at Team SHM GEM Karnataka, Dr. Ajay Chandran, Nandini Shankar, Nandini Sundar, Shiva, Ganeshwar, Arijit, Architect Ravindra, leading this initiative for all their efforts putting together of this event. Thank you one and all. Today's event will go down in the history of SHM Karnataka and Maharashtra as a first of its kind. Thank you and over to Shubha for our partner's recognition. Thank you one and all. Thank you, Abindiji. Thank you so much. And a wonderful vote of thanks, I must say. Please, please put the slide. So friends, uh, uh, first of all, thank you so much for uh, staying with us, uh, I mean, late evening till late evening. And friends, uh, this such a big event, such a mega event is never, never possible without the support of our uh, partners. So we would like to extend our uh, deep gratitude and thanks to uh, Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, Council of Architecture, Naredco and National Book Trust India for their wonderful support to the event. And we are very much thankful to our uh, partners, principal partner, Prince Panasonic, Platinum Partner, ProGuard Plus, Blaze Master, Gold Partner, Meta Tubes, Inner Engineering, ALP, Daikon, Armor Cell, Guardian, uh, SunGuard, Modigard, Santwal, Ignity, and others. So thank you so much once again for being with us. So friends, our tomorrow's session, virtual session is at 11 a.m. tomorrow morning. Harish, can you see the slide? Yes. So friends, our tomorrow's session is at 11 a.m. And the subject is restoration of uh, heritage buildings. And again, we have a galaxy of speakers. This session is a joint session with the uh, Jam Gujarat chapter and Odisha chapter. 
we will soon circulate the information so please join us for uh, another wonderful webinar tomorrow also thank you so much thank you thank you thank you thank you neeraj thank you ji harish uh, please close the session thank you